What's his name? I'm looking for paper pad because last time when I found yours, I was collecting some of the paper pads. Should we go ahead and get started? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep, okay, so this is the TEEP working group. So uh, just to let you know, in case you're not here for TEEP, that's what we will be discussing. Uh, so orders of business, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole note well. Hopefully you know all this by now. Uh, the blue sheets should be going around by now. I know on my left-hand side, they should be halfway through, if not already. But just make sure you uh, you sign the blue sheets. So in advance, I will thank Roman for being an etherpad and Mike for being one of the note takers. Uh, I would like to have one other note taker and a jabber scribe. We, we actually need a jabber scribe. So could we get a volunteer or two, please? Jabber scribe? Anyone? Thanks. I don't know your name, sorry. Oh, oh I need to put my glasses on. Hi, Mike, thanks. Um, you think one note taker is enough? Could we get a second note taker? Thanks, Mike. Yeah. There's a typo on this slide. Those should say IETF 102. If you're looking to join things and type stuff on Etherpad, make sure you join the IETF 102 ones. Yeah, that's my bad. You can see my cut and paste doesn't always work. Uh, but yes, this is the IETF 102. So um, please make sure we note that down. Okay, so let's bash the agenda. So for today, the authors have updated. So at the last face-to-face um, -face meeting, we agreed that um, we needed to have a working group architecture draft. So thanks to the authors, there's, um, there's a draft that's been posted for a week now. Uh, so Hannes and Ming will provide the overview for that. There's already been some comments, which there'll be discussions. Um, there's also been an update to the OTRP uh, solution draft. Again, comments, but um, there'll be a presentation for, for that. We actually had one person and that's my co-chair, uh, who will be presenting his report um, thereafter. And then uh, given some of the comments and feedback, uh, we think it would be a good idea, and Dave um, volunteered to provide uh, not really a, an SGX overview, but rather in the context of TEEP, how SGX would fit, and some of the, the things that we'll need to work through. So that really takes us to the end. We have a full agenda. So I will, um, while I put 30 minutes in there, depending how the Q&A goes and, and the presenters, I may reserve the last five minutes for Q&A. So it may be that you only get 25 minutes. Um, and then we'll go from there. So that's what we have on the agenda today. Any objections, any other comments? Going once, going twice? Cool, okay, so um, let's go ahead and get started with the review of the milestone. So at the last face-to-face, -face, we had put the tentative, we'd already moved some of the dates forward because we said we would have an architecture draft, which we didn't quite have it in March. Um, so we've gone ahead and just adopted a draft, which how many people have actually read the draft? I'll probably ask again. Just a few. Yeah, but it's mainly the authors and, and a couple of commenters. So we're, we're going to need more reviewers. Um, uh, yeah. For those on the remote, there were about eight hands, but uh, realistically, half of them are the authors. Uh, so. Anyway, we've gone ahead and adjusted the milestones 
to ensure that we can stay on target, which is why we put in place, can we and are we on target right now, given the dates? So Ben, ben has actually... Yeah, the parts in red that have been updated since last IETF. It was discussed at last IETF that the milestones were kind of wonky, that they had one case where like we submitted it to the ESG before adopting it as a working group last call and things like that. And so those dates we believe are consistent with the discussion last time and the data tracker now shows the parts in red, but that's not something we've shown you before other than what we were going to do. Now we're just reporting out that these are the dates that are listed right now. Okay, so if there are no comments or issues, I think we should move on, given that we have a, a full agenda. Uh, let's move on to the, uh, Hannes? Yeah, well, Ming and Hannes, but Hannes. Um, I was just wondering whether, uh, like, it would be more sensible to use the March IDF meeting for getting the architecture document done, or have it have that in February, so it's uh, finished in, in March, for example. Um, you know, but, um, so just the thinking. rule of thumb we were following when coming up with the months is to start a working group last call that would conclude at an IETF meeting, mm -hmm. uh, discuss any last call comments at the IETF meeting, mm -hmm. um, and then submit it afterwards. And so that may be in one IETF meeting, you have first working group last call, the next mm -hmm. one you have other discussion, but the point is we decided to submit it right after the IETF meeting instead of right before so that we could make sure that we had consensus on it at the meeting. That was that was the goal, why it's exactly one month after an IETF meeting. Mm. So it's not completely random. Okay. Correct. And the, so the, the April one is right after the, uh, the, the, the spring IETF and the December one is right after the... The, the November. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay, so if there are no more comments, who wants to start being or Hannes on the architecture? Okay. Oh, you, you, that's, so oh that's, that's a good point. <laughs> Oh, you find it? Excellent. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Great. Talk into the empty stand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's hello. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, Ming Lam Pai. Uh, <clears throat> I'll talk about the quick introduction of the uh, document status. <clears throat> so uh, we uh, <clears throat> uh, published, submitted a document, uh, first draft, a work group draft, uh, uh, about two weeks ago, as uh, um, <clears throat> in July second. Uh, it's uh, we already received a couple of uh, good comments uh, in the mailing list about the draft. The draft. Um, the content itself is largely from uh, earlier uh, open trust protocol draft, right? That was a combined one, which has architecture and protocol. And after that, the document was adopted, right? After the document uh, work group adoption, then we split it, uh, split into half. But this has more on that, right? We started to address some uh, comments from last work group and also additional um, uh, feature request for that. Uh, so we. Uh, Try to trace the both the feedbacks there. Um, so the current document structure is this. Here's a content quick uh, quick one, right? We we have a brief overview. They have terminologies. That one area, I think, Hannes and Dave will talk more. But, uh, we have terminology itself because so many definitions. There's a use of different industry or using different uh, forums. Uh, we really need to define what the scope of this architecture should cover. Because there was uh, initially, you know, TE itself has from trust zone and has different background versus SGX and so on. So that's what the scope of what architect tried to address. And we talk about the use cases where this uh, tip uh, applications or uh, technology can be used. Uh, really, the four primary areas we talked. So please, uh, we welcome you to read and give us more feedback, other use cases, right? So today it has been using payment, right? You have a secure application to do payment transaction, use for authentication, right? Device used as authenticator. 
and a large use of IoT devices. Now you have embedded uh, security there. And the one more added is a cloud computing. That was really added from David and others from two working groups before. And so now a uh, cloud host provider does not want to have a liability knowing a tenant's data, right? So a uh, host my application in a cloud application, a uh, cloud host provider with uh, Azure, AWS, or Google, right? I can run my application there, but they do not have to know what I'm running there. That's a very valuable use case. So that's the addition on the from original OTRP. Yeah. Then we start list of the really architecture, that's a core piece, right? Core piece to address the use cases. Uh, amongst architecture, there's one special, special piece called agent, which is a facilitated communication between the time and the, I don't need to detail, I don't need to detail here because this is a third one already. So just good. And talk about the attestation logic and uh, the standard security consideration. Um, so there was some few changes I just quickly highlight here from the original OTRP draft, right? So one is get uh, comments from multiple people, right? Terminology, right? Terminology unification. So there was a concept of secret boot module and trust firmware. So now we only have pick one, right? Trust firmware is the one we choose to use, right? So this is for secret boot. Now they have the concept of security server provider, application developer, TA provider, and so on. So then what that uh, uh, terminology we should use? And a particular server provider, there'll be more discussion later, um, uh, a slide for that. We added a diagram about the what the user experience look like when using trust execution environment, when to uh, distribute, deploy, running, and manage a trusted application. So there's an added diagram for that one. And based on the feedback, which is one feedback, trust firmware verification become optional now. It's not required. Like in SDS case, it's not needed. So we'll make it optional, the proposal for that. We also added one to make transport support as a requirement. It was uh, uh, optional in the very beginning, right? Now we say okay, this as architecture guidance that uh, any solution document should provide the transport support. Uh, we also try to uh, make assumption that architecture support multiple TEs. How to address that one? That will leave it to a solution implementation wise, right? But the architecture that is. And uh, make the binary distribution two ways, once by time, once by TA, uh, cloud application. How do that done? But as architecture, that's more to come up. But that's assumption that you want, you want to address. So that's the main uh, scope of what uh, change introduced there. Uh, so that's, that's, that's one. So there's uh, all those open ones that now such a harness, you put in depth that. Thank you, Ming. So the first item, as Ming already mentioned, so we had this, uh, from a historical point of view, this notion of uh, trusted firmware, not uh, trusted in comparison to untrusted firmware, but uh, the notion that there would be uh, firmware, specific firmware running during the boot press process that has um, sort of a secured boot process for in, in kind of keeping the um, trust zone terminology uh, technology in mind. And so we had an agreement earlier based on discussions with uh, David and others on the mailing list that we would uh, get rid of this because this, uh, this turns out to be a difference between the trust zone approach of uh, implementing a DE versus a SGX based approach. And David is going to talk about this more uh, in his presentation when he uh, goes in explaining uh, some of the SGX background. Uh, so we we tried to do that, or we, we tried to massage the document to get uh, rid of these uh, different text segments that are relevant to this trusted firmware, but um, they're still uh, sort of reading through the document after the submission deadline. I, I realized that there's still some leftover, so uh, there's some editorial work that needs to be done, uh, which will um, be done in the next version, but... I think we, we are settled on this and, and the motivation for it uh, will come later. 
Uh, we could do uh, probably a better job in explaining some of those architectural differences between the different, uh, at least between those uh, types of DEs. I think that could be quite informative for uh, everyone, not, not just for uh, the audience here, but uh, for others who are not involved in the process. Um, I think that's quite, uh, from an, if you are into the hardware design and the security design of hardware, I think that's a pretty cool uh, um, concept and difference. So I will uh, keep that short. Um, this one is an important one that we uh, should spend some time on. And it's also something that Dave has uh, created a few slides with, uh, with message uh, charts or message uh, diagrams to talk about the app distribution or the anticipated app, app distribution. So one um, that we focused on first was the, the second one, the second mode, which is sort of the trusted app being distributed by the, by the dam. And, and that was all along in the, in the initial version of OTRP. But then later, there was also this notion added of having the, uh, the binary, DA binary bundled with the client application, which would be more the notion of uh, SGX and could actually be used also with, uh, um, independently of uh, the underlying DE. But it was just not a model that we looked into uh, specifically. Um, there are some side effects of doing that, and that will be um, covered in, in, in Dave's presentation. So this is definitely we, something we need to make a decision on. Um, one aspect as a, as a food for thought on what the uh, challenges or the implications are is that when you think about um, not just passing binaries around that are the same for all of the devices, but binaries that are actually uh, personalized or that have um, uh, instance, binary instance uh, specific information. So like if you think about the web and the application distribution, there's a lot of uh, customization for the individual uh, binaries sometimes done that are, getting, uh, that are being downloaded. Easier obviously with JavaScript and for, for these type of things. Um, so this is something that the TAM um, has taken over responsibility. It's probably not uh, as explicit as it could be in the document, uh, but probably worthwhile to point out this is, uh, since this is actually functionality uh, being used today. There's also the question of like how over the life cycle is the application updated? Um, the client application as well as the uh, then correspondingly the, the trusted application. And, um, and I just wrote a few uh, questions there like who authorizes that update of an application um, and the DEA, uh, and also um, what would be the security domain? And we, we are going to talk about the security domain in a later slide um, in case you forgot the concept. So this will, will also be covered in more detail in, in Dave's presentation. Um, there's there's a topic that uh, came up on the mailing list, namely the question about a device having one uh, DE or multiple DEs. That can come in, in a single processor having multiple DEs or having even, for example, different DE technology, uh, having, having a, DE, uh, uh, a trust zone component in the processor and a separate uh, uh, DPM chip, for example. Um, in the use cases we initially worked on, we focused on the one um, DE per device model, which is sort of like the mobile phone type of uh, use case. And, and then um, this other uh, model or other deployment situation uh, came along. And that there, the primary, the primary question that was uh, raised uh, through this um, sort of expansion in the architecture was how do we actually make sure that the messages that come from the dam, how are they actually rooted to the right uh, DE, uh, since there are now multiple of those. And the, an assumption that, and we're going to talk about the deep ancient terminology as well. So there was this middleman that relayed the, app, the, the, um, the OTRP messages back and forth, and it didn't have any understanding of the content of those messages. It was purely a, a relay, passing messages from, from the, um, the secure world, if you will, to the dam and, and uh, backwards. So how can we do that? And 
Uh, Dave uh, was kind enough to uh, put a slide together to actually, um, in some sense, answer that question, or at least have a, a proposed answer. Do you want to jump over here? So the one use case that came up at, I think it was at the IETF 101 meeting, it could have been on the mailing list, but the one example that somebody else gave, and I can't remember who it was, maybe it was somebody in this room, said, well, I had, the, the reason that I have multiple TEEs is because they're of different types, right? Maybe I have, you know, a TPM-like thing and a non-TPM-like thing. There are different categories, right? And so if you have a TA binary, I can't just pick any one of them. It's a TA binary that's written to go in a particular type of TEE, right? This is meant to go in inside SGX, or it's meant to go in trust zone and not the other thing. There's multiple things. And so the example case that I'm showing here is for a case we have heterogeneous um, TEs on a device. And so a binary is written to go for a particular type. And so the distinction is type A and type B, whatever those are, okay? And so uh, this is all supposed to be protocol agnostic in terms of the picture here. This is architectural, right? And so at some point, some application or installer of an application, this is step one, gets the notion of, I have this TA I need to be able to install that, that, that such and such depends on it. And here's some constraints about it. Like this is a binary that's meant to run on a blob processor inside of a particular type of thing, right? This is a signed SGX DLL or it's a dot A, um, you know, uh, trust zone binary for, for such and such a processor and so on. So at this point, the box that I'm labeling uh, facilitator, and we'll talk about the terminology later, um, in this example, protocol independent, he knows because the metadata says this requires a type A TEE, and he knows he's running on a box with type A and type B, so he knows which is the correct OTRP client that needs to be able to be, needs to be the one that's communicating with that TAM for purposes of finding out whether it can install TAX. Okay. So in this case, he, he knows that it goes to OTRP client one because he's the one that's in type A. That's the routing decision in this example slide. It's done at the time when uh, the first API call is made into the TE. The outside knows which one it is based on the metadata. That's the proposed answer to the open, open issue. Okay. At this point, now you can set up a session that's an, an OTRP session between that particular OTRP client and the right TAM, and this is not a slide about picking the right TAM, that's a different question, right? But assume you can pick the right TAM. So there's a transport session that he facilitates. And so if you had two different clients for two different TEEs, or two different trusted applications, you have two different transport sessions. So you can see the transport session is tied to going between a particular TAM and a particular TEE's OTRP client. And so any messages that come from the TAM come in the context of a particular transport session and are obvious which one to go to. It's the one for that, that session is bound to this OTRP client, okay? Um, so that's my answer. The routing decision, if you will, is made at the time that the metadata is used and the facilitator starts to open up a connection on behalf of a particular OTRP client. And after that, the answer is easy. So this is my proposed answer to the open issue. Using again, the use case that was discussed last time by somebody else that says, I have heterogeneous TEEs on the same device. And, it, and the good thing is that it doesn't require any new standardization work. This requires no changes to OTRP protocol spec. Yeah. Okay. Actually, this is also um, uh, a placeholder slide to uh, point into what Dave is going to talk about with his experience uh, um, working on the implementation. Um, it addresses the question of like, how does the message interaction actually work between um, the, the client application, the TAM and the DAs? And uh, uh, Dave tried out a couple of different uh, approaches. He posted that question uh, to the list beforehand before he then uh, went off and uh, experimented with the code and to see what a, uh, how he can actually answer it to yourself. So that's why I leave it to Dave to actually uh, answer his own question. Um, so that's a quite a pragmatic approach. And um, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had a lunch discussion. And so this was actually my diagram that he included into his deck. Um, so one of the pieces of feedback on the architecture document was the term agent as used um, is an English word that doesn't mean to most people what it means in the document, right? In normal English, an agent is somebody that is authorized to act on your behalf. 
In the document, the term agent is used to refer to something in the rich operating system that in the rich OS that is not authorized to act on your behalf. Okay. And so the point here is agent is probably the wrong word to use for the thing that's not authorized to act on your behalf. It's just authorized to relay messages it can't understand. Okay. And so the this is a purely editorial terminology question. It's to say, can we pick a word other than agent? And so you'll see for slide discussions, I threw in the term facilitator. I don't care what it is, right? Facilitator, connector, or something else. We just need something. Um, well, for those of us who remember Grapevine, how about broker? Question to the room. I see two thumbs up and a bunch of blank stares. Uh, two th uh, I see, okay. <laughs> Okay, we're, we're kind of all over the right. map. I, I don't know. Uh, this, this may be a discussion for the, the list, right? But right. the point is, the thing that we're talking about is this piece out here. We need a name for it. There's an OTRP session that's encrypted that goes between, or at least authenticated, if not encrypted, right? That goes between some server thing over here and the term that's over here, the document doesn't actually have a term for this piece, right? Here, I made up a term, OTRP client. Um, it has a term for this right here, which is called agent that I didn't like. And whether you call it a broker or whatever else, we can take that to the list to see if other people come up with better names. All right. I don't care what it is, but the question, the point is we need to have a common name for this piece and a common name for this piece. This is Min. So, uh, Min Pai, uh, I think this is a good, a good point. So original was agents try to say it's uh, on behalf of the rich app, talk with T. So that's kind of our behalf. But I think now take the either... Right, uh, as a transport connector, something it's a more neutralized or good. We we'll post it to the list and uh, add some new term for it. Another terminology piece is the service provider, and and currently it's defined as an entity that wishes to supply trusted applications to remote to devices. But then um, the document, the architecture document, goes on and. Um, it provides a little bit uh, of uh, extra text and also distinguishes between a device administrator and it says a device administrator or service provider of the device need to determine security relevant information of a device before provisioning the TA to the device with a uh, TE. And a TE in a device needs to determine whether a device administrator or a service provider that wants to manage a TA in a device is authorized to manage applications in a TE. So, um, Dave came along in his review and asked on whether the device administrator is actually responsible for controlling what apps run in the DE on, for example, uh, an IoT class device, and whether the device administrator is just another uh, form of service provider, or whether those terms are actually uh, mutually exclusive. Um, and it it's a little hard. Uh, it's obviously not as straightforward answer, that's why uh, it's still, um, still an open issue. Uh, currently, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit mixed about this one, um, to be honest. So we, we had uh, initially the, the notion of service provider and uh, application developer or developer. So we got X, the developer term, and, and replaced it, or uh, had only the uh, service provider anymore, but now um, the role of the device administrator is a little bit unclear. I would like to like, clarify a little bit. In the origin document, it was only server provider. So server provider like a bank, right? Bank uh, dedicate uh, the trust application installation to devices through a TAM provider. So server provider really like a bank kind of a concept. And then, then there's a the device administrator, as a use case, was uh, asked right in a last work group in a one one. So now it's come back. The device administrator may mean the manufacturer, maybe a person who manages the devices. It's a different from bank. So it's for me, it's a different uh, different terms. So there's a two use cases here. It's not the same. So for that. Okay. So uh, Dave Taylor. Uh, so I asked. What's that? I think it's on. I think it's on. Um, so Dave Taylor. Um, so I asked the question um, as an individual reviewer of the document, and uh, I like the first definition, meaning the the, the the top bullet on the slide. Right? I think that one is unambiguous. Although um, 
I would tend to prefer a term like TA provider rather than service provider. I think it's actually much closer to the definition and less and more clear. But that said, um, the question came up out of the two sub bullets that's there where it has the or that's in there. Okay. My preferred resolution of this terminology is to say is the if blah 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 is the device administrator just another type of provider? Answer yes would be my preferred resolution. Mm -hmm. And if it's defined that way, then you don't need those ors in there. You'd say a TI TA provider needs to determine and a TA and a T in a device needs to determine whether the TA provider wants that so on. And so on. You wouldn't need to express them both because the device administrator is just a subcase of one particular type of TA provider, right? And so that's my preferred resolution. I'm happy with other approaches too, but we got to be talking about the same thing. We're just talking across, across each other. Uh, Dave Wheeler from Intel. Um, I, I see a device administrator as fundamentally different um, as, as, as making a decision of what can be on the device. So that maybe that device administrator is managing the set of uh, trust anchors, right? Or is authorizing the TAM to make the decisions on behalf of them. So it may be some, some sort of um, ecosystem around enabling a TAM on a device, um, either through the trust anchors or directly through enabling uh, what, what TAM has access. But I, I think that needs to be built into the TAM kind of interactions and the TAM is sort of the entity that takes the place of the device administrator because he's making a lot of decisions on what TAs get installed and, and signed and things like that. And then the service provider is just the one who is asking for a particular TA uh, to be installed. That's, that's the way I see it. I don't disagree with anything that David Wheeler said. So I don't have to. It's too card here. Um, I think this comes down to scope of authority of the different roles. And uh, my instinct is that a service provider defines the rules of engagement that a particular trusted application would go by if I choose to install it. And that's up to that service provider and I get to decide whether or not I'm willing to adhere to those rules of engagement. Whereas a device administrator is going to determine whether or not I'm actually even going to enter into that relationship uh, with the service provider in the first place. And so it kind of comes down to the interpretation of the subtle words, wishes to supply TAs. Can you stay at the mic? Clarifying question. Are you assuming that there is a relationship between the TEE and the service provider in all use cases? Because I don't think that's the case in all use cases right now. You want to constrain it to use cases where there is a uh, security relationship between those two. Well, just logistically, can you state your name too, please? Sorry, Stu, S-T-U, card, C-A-R-D. Um, I can't answer your question because I haven't thought about it sufficiently deeply yet. Um, oh. I, I'm, I'm just saying that there's, there's this notion of rules of engagement mm -hmm. that one party provides and that another party may or may not wish to agree to. One of the possible use cases discussed, just to help you think about it, was a case where there's a relationship between the TAM and the service provider and a relationship between the TAM and the TEE, and so it's only indirect. Right. So there's a direct use case, there's an indirect use case. Are they both in scope is kind of the question, yeah. But it, I, I think um, from from the feedback, like I like the sort of the change or the adjustment of uh, considering the service provider being more that the trusted application repository in some sense or a provider. And if you see it that way, um, I think the answer to your question is whether this is just a, the device administrator is just a, a sub uh, category of service provider is uh, where David's uh, comment is, is no. Um, so, so yeah, <clears throat> quickly, I agree with David. I said it's different, but my point is that I say original server provider or use by default, definitely, maybe it's just in scope. The device administrator say it's a word itself. I'm admitting the device itself, whether it should be in scope, but it was out of scope. I think maybe just it would just the had the TA supply as a server provider case. Okay, so we can move on and uh make those changes. 
Um, another one, another topic was uh, we had a discussion on. Oh, did I do that? It's not an AV, it's only the projector. About to get a software update here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, right. No, it doesn't work anymore. Okay. So another discussion we had on the list was uh, regarding the uh, terminology used for keys. So we had trust anchor terminology and root of trust terminology. And then, uh, which then evolved into a question about what are the keys actually being used for. Um, and here I, I copied the table from uh, the architecture document and added some additional, or tried to add some additional clarity on um, what the different keys are being used for. So we have the DE key, which is uh, really used for attestation. And when um, the terminology of trust anchors came in, People were saying, oh, you can't use the trust anchor terminology that I actually uh, copied or referenced from uh, Russ's, uh, from one of Russ's uh, RFCs, uh, because, because of the special use of those keys for attestation. Um, there is also this other uh, key pair, which is used then for, uh, for signing and, and uh, uh, potentially for encrypting of the software, which is uh, separate to that and also needs to have some. Uh, keys associated with it. So different proposals on what we should do about it. So they, uh, Dave came up with a somewhat detailed uh, proposal on how we should distinguish those two terms. Um, Andrew, on the other hand, suggested to just remove the trust anchor terminology and uh, then we don't have to uh, worry about the dis distinction between those two. Uh, of course, the trust anchor term is uh, used throughout the document I thought it was a pretty, um, I've, I argued that both terms are very similar. Um, I didn't want to go into the, the details on or have separate terms just because we use the keys differently because they are described or the key usage is described throughout uh, the document anyway, including the table that I had just shown. Uh, so let me give you a, a quick glance on um, what the term is uh, that they proposed. Um, um, Probably not going to read it out to you, but uh, Russ, you want to? Do you have, or David, do you have a specific? Uh... So, if you would back up to the table, sure. It appears to be the case that a certificate authority is involved in all of these cases. Yes. And so, if you want to just reference uh, 5280 and say, validate the cert like described over there. You ought to use the words described over there, yeah. which is trust anchor, which is what I did. <laughs> That's what that was my that was my thinking actually. Um, so I, I'm I'm not sure that in all this is Dave Wheeler from Intel. Um, I'm not sure that in all cases you do have a certificate. Um, the table, <laughs> yes, the table may be wrong, but, but, but I may have a different opinion. Um, okay, but but I think we need I think we need to talk. Uh, through that okay. carefully, because in in some cases uh, it, in trusted firmware, I may not have a certificate associated um, uh, with that key. Um, I, I also think that we need to think we we need to m make sure that we the cardinality here is correct as well, because I think if we have multiple devices, we might have um, uh, multiple. Um, TEE keys, but it's also possible that a TEE may have multiple um, attestation keys in order to provide right. anonymity. Right. So, so point. I think yeah. we, need, we need to think through our use cases yeah. here and, and whether they are signed under a, a CA and, and what the cardinality yeah. is and talk through some of those use cases. Yeah. So the, the first one on the um, trusted firmware key that is really sort of uh, a leftover from what I mentioned earlier. So maybe that should actually not be so prominent in, in that table or uh, throughout the document in the first place because uh, uh, it relate, related to the issue that I mentioned for, uh, earlier. Currently, there's only one attestation mechanism defined in sort of the architecture, which is based on 
um, a per device key or uh, key pair. And that's, that's why the cardinality is right. So it doesn't talk about group keys or other attestation concepts where you ship the same um, uh, key pair to uh, a bunch of uh, devices to provide some anonymity. Um, just to explain why the table is as it is. Russ. Uh, Russ Housley. Um, what I think Dave was talking about is whether you validate a certificate or you validate a signature uh, directly with the public key that is stored in the device. That's the trust anchor versus something else, right? Okay. So we, we address that same issue in a, another protocol called TAMP, Trust Anchor Management Protocol. Mm -hmm. So again, we could tr just grab the same terminology and not have the argument. Yeah. But actually, uh, currently, uh, the document really focuses on the attestation mechanism is literally assuming a certificate. It's not just a, a raw key. Okay, so Dave, uh, Dave Taylor. Um, so part of the discussion is, part of the issue is, yeah, you're gonna pick one or the other, or maybe both or something, but it's better to pick one or the other, okay? Um, but because we have uh, multiple communities, um, regardless of which one we pick, we need to explain that it's the same as what the other communities use by the other term. And so, for example, even in our charter, it says we have to have a good relationship with, you know, TCG and global platform and so on. And TCG and global platform both use root of trust for X as their terminology. Okay. So whichever one you, if let's say you choose trust anchor, that might be fine to use in the document as long as there's some place that says, and this is the same thing that these other communities mean by root of trust for X. Okay. And so in that sense, you're using them both, but you're using one of them only in one place and using the other term everywhere. And the question is, which term do you want to use everywhere? And the other one you're going to use only in one place, which is like in the definition or something, right? And David, um, I, I wonder whether it's good to sort of like, you know, very generically refer to um, uh, TPMs because many of them, as we had uh, discussed earlier, actually don't allow that functionality we are talking about here. They are... Um, sort of hardwired, so it, any of this is sort of not applicable. So I, I guess it would be up to someone who is really into um, uh, that organization to, uh, to sort of refer to the right terminology to, to, uh, to reference technology that actually allows even the, the use of the, uh, the OTRP and the update of uh, trusted applications and so on. So Okay, so I'm going to preempt time because okay. there are 35 minutes Quick one. So, okay, uh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, Minpai, uh, two points. Uh, first of all, about the public key uh, versus certificate. Current document uh, in scope is we require a certificate, right? Require a certificate. Purpose of that was say, time do not want too many public keys that are like a uh, trust firmware. All the public keys are managed by a time that does not scale. That's the whole purpose. We want to use a certificate there one can validate many devices. That's one intention. So very, very important choice there. Uh, second point is about, uh, yeah, cardinality, that was wrong. That uh, you can have multiple TE keys per device. I think we need to uh, update that one. So the discussion of CA versus not a certificate or whatever, let's take that to the list since that hasn't been discussed mm -hmm. on the list yet. Mm -hmm. So let's tee that up as a question to be discussed. Yeah. And also how to support other forms of these. Skip this one. Oh, security domain concept. Um, so currently, uh, we have this this uh, concept where there's an isolation concept, at least where the uh, on the uh, DE side, where trusted applications reside in a security domain, and if there are two trusted applications in that security domain, they are able to share resources. That's sort of like the definition from uh, from the from the document. Um, and there are messages that allow you to create those security domains and then put the trusted applications in there. So the question is uh, that arises is, uh, or that came up is, what happens if in most cases there are just one uh, trusted application per security domain? What is the implication on, on the protocol uh, exchange? Can, can we actually get away with uh, having always to go through a separate security domain uh, establishment 
when you actually want to just have one application per, uh, per security domain, as it is uh, the case in, in some technologies. That's something that we, we still have to struggle with. And that's it. Okay. More architectural discussion later in other presentations in uh, Fine and in David Wheeler's. So this is now the uh, protocol part. So architecture may want to change. I think a lot more discussion that is driving the solution document, right? So uh, uh, just briefly talk about most part do not need 30 minutes for that one. So just give a quick status update uh, of that one and talk about the changes we made uh, in the work group document, virtual prior document a little bit to talk about the architecture protocol mapping. It's a roughly, it's a, so far it's consistent, but we're adding more features into architecture as this discussion is see. Then we will accordingly change the protocol part. So I think the driving one would be the architecture. So, but this will give you a quick update of that one. Uh, so we had a draft uh, <coughs> approved by work group in a, a March or March uh, that meeting, then officially getting in, uh, in April, and uh, the minor change, right? Draft the name to work group find name, and a few comments change on uh, that one. And then we made a uh, version one uh, one zero. It's a uh, uh, that is uh, when we uh, produce the architecture document, then we make a change. It has product documents take out some content that was too much uh, architecture oriented, and we leave, we try to avoid certain overlapping there. Uh, uh, and the architecture documents a little more general than the original ITIP. So for that change, that update that on. <clears throat> so here's a quick refresh on that. Like, how many people have read the OTIP? Uh, this is a draft. Is it was still the. Yes, okay, but uh, several hands. So that I have a quick refresh here, right? For people new, so what it is, right? So even architect document will directly jump in and so assume you already know. So um, but a quick refresh here is uh, originally it's one document, right? It's talking about architecture, design purpose, use case, you try to address, and architecture, then the protocol part. So now, the use cases and architecture move to architecture draft, like a larger move draft. And this one uh, would retain the protocol part, really is how is it, what's the method protocol is, what's the APIs. Yeah? So uh, under cover, the protocol is a method protocol, okay, method protocol. Uh, method part defines uh, message exchange between a TEE and a TAM. TAM is a trusted application manager. Trust of your manager. Uh, we choose to use JSON based message for now. There were other comments uh, or the desire to go to more uh, compressed, more uh, uh, binary uh, message format for this one. So, one major choice was that we use asymmetric key and certificates. Okay, with certificates, like I mentioned earlier, <laughs> asymmetric certificates to make it more efficient for the mutual trust verification between the device and a server provider, which, which delegate trust through a trust application manager at right, time. Okay. Uh, uh, between a uh, remote service like time and a device, you need to communicate. I talk about it here, we introduce this uh, uh, agent, right? There was discussion earlier, as the name is looks uh, different now. We may change it to the broker, connector, or something, right? So that's a really, really the message between device and uh, 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 time. Someone may ask why you need uh, such a connector. Uh, just note that uh, many of you may, you may may not know, TEE does not have capability to handle transport. Yeah? So, but at least the trust zone TEE implementation, it doesn't know how to talk outside of it. So you must have a, a application in which world, in the normal world, to facilitate that. That's where this is introduced, right? Uh, normal application, like a mobile phone case in Android, for example, normal application, you talk with time, you talk with TE, right? Then you need something like that. That was introduced as part of architecture. Okay? Uh, and we added one to support transport binding. That means 
between T, uh, between T and the time. Okay, time needs some interoper way receive messages or uh, reach application, install or whatever. Uh, or this uh, agent needs top of time. So what the protocol should you use? So we added uh, one, so you support uh, uh, transport layer like TOS and SSL and so on. Yeah. Um, so this is a glimpse of the world messages. We have seven APIs. Okay, each API means some messages. Seven APIs used today. You already you can see first one is a global query. So query what is the device status? How many trust applications running in the device? And what TE it is, what TE it is, and what trust application running, and what uh, secure domain you have. After that, it's just a uh, uh, two set of management APIs. First one, manage secure domain. So secure domain is uh, central to the concept of this protocol. It's a create secure domain. You can update the secure domain and delete the secure domain. So when we map to the other TE, uh, like SGX, we also want to think about it. this concept don't apply to what the means that isolation of the uh, T uh, applications, yeah? trust applications. So the major ones about trust application management, that's the main target, right? Eventually, secure domains isolation, but then we have, the, you install trust application, once you install your life cycle, it's really the life cycle management. You install trust application, update to trust application, and delete trust application. So that's the ultimate goal, okay? Whether you go to SGS others, that's the ultimate one. So you have an application you need to run there. Yeah. So that's the uh, really protocol, uh, the part is trying to cover the, um, and this gives you a little bit of scope, right? Say so you have messages with defined message protocol uh, between uh, T and a time. So it was like kind of, between T and time, right? Then if the message defined, then we have this kind of a kernel, it's called OTIP agent. I hear David's point. This is a, a may not be a, a precise word. So this was used to do transport. It's really for city transport. So you have some messages from time, you need some TE, and you have response from TE, you need send up time, right? They cannot, there's no connection you can establish. Something here need to do that job. And that's a kind of OTAP agent. We say, I say, if you've got a transport connector, it sounds, sounds maybe closer to the, what it, uh, functionality it is. Yeah. Um, so this give a flavor of the message. It's, this is a standard JSON message use. Okay? Uh, for API called create a security domain request and create a security domain response. Those will be JSON messages. But the message you need to be signed and encrypted. And the sign and encryption use a standard uh, JSON uh, spec in IFC. All right, I, there's two IFC for that one. Okay, two IFC. That's a, we didn't really, we don't want to reinvent this. It just use whatever in IFC already specified. So just give a flavor what it, how it looks like. Uh, the changes, so I just a little bit quick one here. It's a remove general architecture specification to the architect draft. Uh, and we change the overview part. So the protocol part of change was, uh, um, we adjusted the introduction part with a little bit change, overview and the introduction change. So now I say that follows the architect draft. Right? So that's some old, uh, document update for that. Not really, uh, really, really uh, protocol change. We uh, refer to terminology. We, we move it out to the terminology section because we only have one to one. Architecture document will define that one. We reuse the same terminology. We will not repeat it. Uh, but we retain this entity relationship and a key type of saw because that was and has been what the OTRP use as a solution, right? And architect document also refer to that one. We will see. Uh, this two will be consistent, right, with terminology and uh, architecture realization. Uh, talk about. So there will be no uh, API level change and no message change because that was uh, the uh, core protocol part. There's no change. It's more about the um, document uh, compliance. Uh, but one change was about trust of firmware, trust of firmware part. So as requested, it should not be required. 
So now we'll make it optional. Okay. What's optional now? Time has a uh, decision to make today. Say you receive a message from TEE. For TE, it may option include uh, some assertion about that trust firmware or that firmware not trust firmware. So it may decide are trusted or not trusted. But that is a backward compatible. Also can support other cases. And then we also have some clean up about the terminology. One thing about this uh, circuit boot module, and that they will give the comments that we have two there, they do the same thing. So we just keep the one. Okay, we choose to use the trust firmware. Uh, uh, this one, I think, I take stock market. I will not repeat it here. So this has a there's gaps today because the new features about multiple TE support, uh, TA binary distribution by client application. This has not been designed in the OTP protocol yet, but right? we'll continue to uh, work on the architecture. What's the resolution for that one? Then we'll put into the protocol part. Protocol part. Uh, so this is more for that one. We have some idea here. Just discuss how to support multiple TE. I think I will leave that for David because David will also talk about his slide diagram, right? How to facilitate multiple TEs. Type A, type B. He already explained. I don't know what to uh, uh, repeat this one. Binary distribution. Uh, there was some uh, okay. The uh, hands talk about right uh, challenges. We want to the trust the application binary inside the client application. There will challenge, a few challenges are already repeated. I don't want to repeat here. But once this was discussed, we'll put in the protocol because there's issues about the life cycle management. Not the first one. It's after that, how to manage that secure domain or how to update the trust application and so on. Um, and then how to handle the agent part. So this will be uh, continued work. I would expect the next revision will uh, cover more in this aspect. Uh, so, yep, that's, a, that's about it. Yep. Okay, this is uh, Dave Thaler as an individual participant, and he's the chair over there. Um, so at a uh, hackathon, there was no TEEP stuff like pre-prepared or whatever, but since I was at hackathon, I decided to use that as an opportunity to say, what would I need to do to implement OTRP? Um, could I do it just by looking at the spec? Um, and so I started that. Of course, I didn't get very far, but I got far enough to generate a bunch of issues. I should mention that I already have experience in writing trusted applications for both TrustZone and SGX. Um, I've done both. In fact, I've done business logic that worked that can be compiled into both an SGX enclave and a trust zone. So I understand both issues. And so I was writing code to try to be as not agnostic as possible, but I was doing it on an SGX capable laptop. Okay. And so I didn't have trust zone hardware in hand. I had SGX capable hardware in hand. So anyway, so this is a hackathon report where I was the one active coder there. There were other T people in the room. Hannes was sitting right next to me and Nancy was just uh, within uh, uh, earshot. So, um, so there were several tape people in the room, but I was busy uh, coding. All right, so then anyway, this I sent to the list, a list of 10 issues. I'm not gonna go through all of them because at least one or two of them, David Wheeler is gonna cover in his presentation, um, but I'm gonna cover some of them. And so I'm just gonna show up there what they are and I'll focus on a couple of aspects in there, okay? So the first one is that the first step that happens, and I'll show this on the next slide, is that something reaches out to the TAM to provide it a, here's the TA that I need. The OTRP document does not define any message syntax for doing that. In fact, it implies that it's not part of OTRP, but it's ambiguous. So I couldn't actually implement the first message in the exchange. So I made something up. Uh, and you'll see that on the next slide. Right? I made something up that actually does not require that message because it doesn't say what it is. Right? Okay. So the second issue, uh, and Dave is going to talk about this one, is the TAM needs to keep track of what TAs are installed. And so I'm not going to talk about this in more detail because Dave Wheeler is. And we keep saying Dave's going to cover this. Sometimes people meant me, and sometimes people meant Wheeler. Um, OK, so uh, the third one is there's an extra round trip. And so I discussed this in the list, and that's where I'm going to get to my slide here. OK, this is what the draft says. OK, step one, uh, this is an example flow. I, I found the example flow section to be extremely useful. I, I, I could use that to say, here's step one, step two, step three. This is what I'll implement. Okay. Um, what it says is that 
something it gets a hold of the uh, TA or the, the, the reason. So step one is not a protocol thing. It happens sort of out of band. You figure that out, right? You now know that you need to install this rich application, and it depends on the following TA. Whether it's bundled or not, it gets the metadata. Okay. What then it says, it says, I reach out to the TAM. I know which TAM it is based on metadata or whatever, and say, I need TAX with no syntax defined. Okay. This is not an encrypted OTRP session. It's an unencrypted, unauthenticated, untrusted message. At this point, the TAM can now reach out to the OTRP client using an encrypted, trusted session that goes between the TAM and the, T and the TEE that says, hey, what are you and what TAs do you have? And the response in the step six is, oh, well, I'm a foo TEE and I have TAs A and B. So there's these three messages that at the end of the day, this is used to figure out that there's a desire to install TAX in the foo TEE. And so that's one issue is that there's three messages and, and whether you have, well, yeah, well, here it's inferred because I need TAX, well I have A and B, I didn't see X in this list, therefore I need to put X in you, okay? And so there's work on the TAM to say, take this and see if it's in this list, okay? And then secondly, this notion that the rich app has to be running and, it, and the rich app has a TAM transport. It does not say that that's mandatory, that's just how it's described, and so one can infer that it's mandatory uh, because it doesn't say. So this is what the draft says. As an implementer, here's what I wanted to do. What I wanted is I wanted there to be something like an app installer, like an app store thing that talks to you know, Steam at the Google Play Store, or the Xbox Store, whatever it is, that goes and grabs stuff and gets manifests, and that has the facilitator code in it so that the rich app doesn't have to be launched if it is going to fail because the dependency is rejected, okay? And so what I want is I wanted one message that says, I'm a foo and I need TAX. So here there's a different flow that's what I wanted where I wanted the facilitator piece in here to start by saying, hey, OTRP client, I have a dependency on TAX. This thing can then initiate in the other direction. So in other words, the first message, OTRP message, goes from the OTRP client to the TAM, as opposed to how it's defined right now with the first OTRP message goes from the TAM to the, to the, down to the TEE, right? And so it says backwards in terms of the first message, okay? This is what I wanted to implement, but I couldn't do that in the current spec, okay? And so the, what I wanted was one message instead of three to get the information. This doesn't have the problem that David Wheeler is gonna mention, that I talk about, which is I have to keep track of all the installed TAs over here. It doesn't have that as a requirement. And if he says reject, then there's no reason to even launch this rich application in the future. I don't have to worry about installing the rich application if the metadata says that dependency is a hard dependency. Okay, so that's what I wanted. I couldn't do that, but this is my use case as to what I wanted to implement. And so I started implementing the closest thing that I could, and that's where my comments came from. Okay, okay. Uh, next couple of issues. I mentioned that there, oh, OCSP stapling data, there's no normative reference. Uh, I'm not an OCSP expert. I didn't know where to look, and so I skipped this part. Uh, I'm saying, remember, the task was, could I implement it from the document, not having any extra knowledge? And I found, no, I couldn't do that. Okay. Uh, the next one, I'm not going to go into much details other than there's this uh, field that says that it is there to make sure that the message was received by the right device. So the OTRP client and the TEE parses it and said, does this have my device ID in it? If not, it must have been destined for the wrong person, the wrong entity. And to me, this seems redundant because it came from a TEE across the session or whatever that that could go away, I think, but if it can't, then it seems to be missing from some of the other messages that Ming had on his slide. And so that was a point of confusion in the document. I wasn't sure exactly how to deal with that. Okay. Uh, the next one, I think Andrew responded on the list that there's some blue Boolean-ish fields that are defined as strings. And Andrew pointed out on the list that actually the document itself was internally inconsistent. In some places it says the same field is of type Boolean in JSON. In other places it's of type string, quote, true, quote, false, even for the same field. And Andrew said, yeah, that was an oops. Um, but I wanted them to be Boolean types, not strings, because if you do allow Seaborn coding, Ming mentioned that it was JSON right now. There is an individual document that's the Seaborn coding proposal. I think it, I don't know if it was from Carson or whoever else. If we go that way in the future, then having it be a type gives better compression. It is implementable except for the point where the same field is discussed as being uh, contradictory in two places. Okay. 
Um, okay, the next major-ish issue, one worth drawing a picture anyway, one that I want to talk about is number seven, which is uh, this extra round trip to create a, a, a security domain, right? I mentioned before the extra round trips necessary to initiate it, right, where I couldn't implement the first message, right? Um, uh, and so I wanted to have a diagram on that one, and I'll come back to number eight, which is also worth mentioning. So uh, here's what the exchange says right now. The TAM says, creating a security domain, and it comes back and says, okay, here's a key that you can use for subsequent operations. And then the TAM says, okay, I'd like to install this TA in the security domain. Here's the key that I have for the site. And it says, okay, done. There's these two steps here. Now, in the common case, there's exactly one TA per security domain. That's not the only case we care about. It's just a common case. Okay. In other words, because the security domain is providing isolation among TAs, like Hannes mentioned on his slide, right? And so if every TA wants to be isolated from every other ones, including ones from the same author, right, then you want there to be a separate security domain. And so this notion that every time I install one of these, I need to create a new security domain is two messages to do the same operation, which is to install stuff. And so I said, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't need to send this message? It could just be done by sending this message. Because if you look at the inputs in here and the inputs in here, they're exactly the same things in that message. The only exception being that did field that I was mentioned on the previous slide that I found confusing. Okay. And so I said, could you optimize this out to say the first one of these does this as a side effect? If it isn't there, create it. Okay. Could that be a side effect for optimization? Again, that's still backwards compatible. You're just providing an optimization that says, if it hasn't been done yet, do it as a side effect. So we had this exchange on the list where I think it was Andrew was explaining, oh, but this key that you're getting is, is, is the main thing. Okay. Because what this key lets you do is if you choose to encrypt the TA binary or the data associated with it, with information that is unique to that device, like only that device could decrypt, here's the data that goes with it. Okay. And this key is useful here. So he was saying, if there's encryption, okay, so first of all, encryption is not mandatory, so there's two cases, okay. If you're not using encryption, then of course it's redundant information, it's just an extra round trip, okay. You can implement it, yes, it's just inefficient, I didn't like it, but I could implement it, okay. Um, so it doesn't carry additional information and it's just less efficient, right, so it could be done. So let's take the case that he was talking about, where you require encryption. So the key that you're getting out of create SD right now is a different key for each security domain. The architecture document explains that the same security provider can have any number of security domains. Like if you have five apps in the device, you could have each one have its own security domain. So I'm the security, the, 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 the provider. I got five apps and therefore I have five security domains because I want them to have you know, memory protection from each other. Okay, that's my choice. Uh, and so how many keys do I have? If I create a new security domain for each one, I have five keys. If you go back to that table that we were commenting on with Hannes and Russ and I, it was labeled as a service provider key, not a security domain key. So what's the granularity here? Is it one key for security domain where there's multiple per service provider, or is it just one for per service provider? So I claim that bundling the notion of the service provider key into a per SD message is not the right granularity. That was my conclusion in thinking through this, okay? As it may not be the right message to do that operation in, or maybe we need some other variation of that exchange. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just saying that was the issue, is that I ended up with five keys, even though the architecture document or the, the table says they only need one. So it's mismatch, okay? And so my recommendation is don't convolute key creation by the service provider and the isolation boundaries. Those are two separate concepts. Don't use security domain to do both purposes. That was my recommendation as an individual participant to the group. Okay. Um, there's ID fields that are underspecified. And I think even Andrew agreed, yes, they're underspecified. Uh, it just says they need to be unique. It doesn't say what they have to be unique within. Do they have to be globally unique? Do they have to only be unique within a particular session between the TEE and the TAM, right? For example, can I use a sequence number or not? If I use a sequence number, it is not globally unique. It's unique within my session. It didn't say. Right now, they're right now they are strings. And Andrew said, "Oh, well, that means you could use GUIDs. If you need global uniqueness, this is good. You can use GUIDs. If you only need per session uniqueness, extra complexity that's overkill. Tell me, I can use a sequence number. Okay. The document doesn't say right now, so I didn't know how to implement that. 
Uh, and so that's kind of uh, where I started saying, what do I do here and making a guess and which could be wrong, okay. So uh, if it only needs uniqueness within a particular session, integers would be much more efficient, but that's something we should collectively decide is what's the intent of uniqueness for the request ID and the transaction ID. I could not, as an implementer, think of a reason why an integer would not be sufficient. Okay, uh, uh, Andrew seemed to think that GUIDs would be useful, but I can't think of a use case for, for uniqueness beyond a session. So if there is one, let me know. Otherwise, uh, as, a, as an implementer, I would prefer an integer here. Okay. Um, come on. And then lastly, this was an editorial issue. I found it confusing that this, what looked like the same thing was referred to by two different strings in here. You can see the only difference is the TEE and TPS in the middle of it. Um, there was an explanation. I think it was Ming posted the list that I didn't understand at all, so I still don't understand this one, but this is purely editorial. There's no technical issue here. I could implement it no matter what. I just found it longer to implement it because I had to flip back and forth between places to figure out what it was talking about. And then uh, lastly, this one is kind of architectural specific as I was thinking about how to arrange code. Um, it is unclear in the document, at least in the places that I could find when I was looking at the time, um, whether a rich app is allowed to depend on two A's from different TAMs. My hypothesis is yes. And whether a TA can depend on another TA, including one from a different TAM, where my hypothesis was yes. Now, since then, I think Ming or somebody else posted on the list that um, there may not be a use case for that or, or whatever. And so I wanted to comment on that because this is, I think, my last slide here. Um, that when writing, forget trusted applications for a second. When writing applications that are distributed in various types of app stores and things, um, it is not uh, that uncommon to have a dependency on something that has another dependency. Okay, This is not uncommon. My um, claim is that the way that uh, the more trusted applications that get developed, the more and more likely it is that that same model will translate over for the same types of reasons as people do it for the rich application dependencies. Okay? So I fully expect this to become common even if it is not common now. I don't think the protocol has to change significantly to accommodate this. So I don't think it's a showstopper to say that, yes, a TA can depend on another TA. It's just another way of expressing dependencies, right? Okay. But again, the expression of dependencies is outside the scope of the protocol. So I think the existing protocol messages can be used to do that. Okay, there we go. I think that's my last slide. Happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to pass it on to David Wheeler to talk about SGX implications. Yeah. How are we doing on time? We're doing fine. Doing fine. Okay, great. That means you can take whatever time you want. But yes, if there's, just, do, if there's do, questions do, or do, comments. We should clarify on the mailing list. I will do a little bit quick uh, uh, response uh, on these 10 issues. Uh, I'm not the chair for this discussion, Nancy. So <laughs> Nancy and I. How much time? <laughs> yeah, so how much time? How much, how much time before David gets to his allotted time if we have questions we'll have online? Yes, yeah, so, so, so 50 minutes we, okay. left. We can. Okay, so, so if you have questions yeah. on my stuff, yeah, yeah, so we have time, you've got like. like five, ten minutes, okay. and then we can okay. use the rest of the time. Okay. I mean, okay. I'd like five minutes just okay. to close. Okay. Yeah, go back. So if you want to go back to these and discuss these now, now yeah. is a good time. Yeah, I want to quick, okay. yeah, quick yeah. some comments here, so if you get an audience, a lot of audience, good to uh, yeah. share this mainly. And Sorry. then start from, yeah, backwards. Yeah, let's from 10, go back to 1. This one? Yeah, no, no, from 10. Like, no, out backwards. From, from 10, from 10, Yeah, Sorry. yeah, refresh from that. There. Okay, now, last one, okay. okay. Yeah, last one that was I think that we, it's a, a one it was like a Andy or Andrew Andy we call yeah. him Andy okay. uh, it's a, um, it was not in original scope right multiple TAs chaining relationship so now a TA install another TA that was not in the scope. scope so we'll, we'll address that I think we need to discuss yeah. offline yeah. that be a yeah. little bit of scope chain on uh, the nine nine it was a uh, reply to say a device may have multiple TA so Get the device state response consists of a list of get the device T state TPA response. That was a relationship. Okay. What do we okay? One is a list of others. Okay, that uh, just a uh, clarify okay. concept. Uh, I did not find that clear in the document. So this <laughs> okay. is a pure, the, number nine is purely editorial. Yeah, editorial I just went at it and stirred okay. the pages for a okay. while. So I think Andrew yeah. is on the uh, lines. So on let me see. Okay, Andy, great. yeah. Hi, Andy. Hi, hi. Andrew? Can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yeah. So we can see you. You are. You're up. So, so firstly, thanks to, to David. Um, it's really important that we get feedback from people working with the protocol um, at, to, to, to raise these issues. I, I do want to cover the point about the encryption of the TA being optional, uh, which I think you, I think David, you were saying that TA encryption was optional, and for the case where it wasn't required, the, um, the message protocol could be shortened. I believe right now in the protocol document, the TA encryption is mandatory. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Continue here. Okay. Let's just jump on this issue. Okay. So today, yes, I think that's a, a David, you made a good purpose. I think there's an optimization case. You know, yes, before yes. the current problem was solved, right. the very I, value proposition of T binary itself, it will be always encrypted. And so that when pass from uh, supply to TE, no man in middle, including any client application, you never see the binary itself, so that they could reverse engineer. So However, that, that is a valid use case. I don't know why that should be required. I understand. For so the in case, signed, yes. Right? signed yes. Some use case they don't care. Yeah. Then we can bundle it. Then maybe I think they will leave an option here. I think that for that one. But yeah, perhaps we should clear be clear yeah. on what encryption means: confidentiality or integrity. So this is or both. the binary itself. So, both. So, the the both. binary itself yeah, cannot be read by an intermediary. Is the case that that's right. So, right. so confidentiality here. Okay. Okay, confidentiality let, of the code. Can I go back to the yeah. issue eight, seven, or the, I quickly each comma each one. Uh, uh, but just, uh, this is the one that was this yeah, one, this yeah, is the one that, that was Andy talking is about. talking. Yes. Yeah. If you know you can, okay. uh, yeah, okay, we're we'll talking about this one. Let's go back, roll back one more slide, eight to seven. Which one? Eight, seven? Okay, there we go. Yeah, eight to seven. Eight, eight we could, uniquely, yeah, those ones are the way uh, Andy also coming online. Yeah. So that one's more consumer when then the time itself to track this request uh, are sent. When next in the session, yeah, next yeah, yeah. response of compati, I can link myself. So really unique within time. So that that's why I do not make good, but we can within change a that. session, right? Yeah, within so a session. So I got multiple right. sessions to the same TAM, it's only unique within right. each session. Yeah. And I go come and go to seven. Okay. Yeah. Uh, seven. So today uh, there was a design purpose in the beginning. So when an application says I want to install TA, maybe TA already installed in device. Yes. So it is an upgrade or it's a new installation. That's why it make a round trip to time first. Time set. Tell me, do you have the TA already not? If you do, it's upgrade, not installation. So that was so the intention. You said TAM, I think you meant you asked the TEE what's in there. You said ask the TAM. TAM. I said no TAM. In current one, because current one is a client application, talk with a Time first. Right. Say, so I want to doesn't the, know. The time is not time, that, time initiated the first request, get device state. It asks TE, tell me what TS you already have. If you already have the TA, I will send a command to update TA, not say install TA. That's why that was a get device state that was always the first call. Secondly, other than the upgrade versus new installation uh, decision it make, there's also integrated part. There may be multiple concurrent session. TA already installed in the middle of it. I do all because of uh, some second attempt. Then if you send a command, it's not installed, it should be upgraded. So that's where the clean state is important for time to know. It doesn't need to maintain, it doesn't have to store it, but it need to ask for it. So because I, we have uh, a new device. That was the design yeah. intention in current protocol, just uh, to clarify. Right. I think the most important thing that you said is it doesn't need to store it. I mean, no. It needs it within the context no, of the not. exchange, but it does not have to retain a list. That's right. That's where what the document says is different from what you just said. And yeah. I think the way that you phrased it is better. And <laughs> uh, David Wheeler is going to talk about for everybody else why that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. I think they have a, it's just to get clarified there yeah, why yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. question pop up, right? Yeah. I came up. So, okay. I think that's the ask is that one. Okay. Uh, six. Uh, okay, the set one, that's, uh, that's uh, an editor. Right, Five, exactly. that's a unique identifier. That's a, it's a device, DID is a device identifier. It hash off the device certificate. So we know it's always, I uh, receive right. this one, send it back the same thing. To quick match, it's optional value, by the way, it's optional right. value. Right, my, yeah. my main point was, either it should be in all seven of those messages or in zero of the messages and use an underlying identifier for all seven of them. Uh -huh. uh, I don't care which, but it seems odd for yeah. it to be in one and not seven. Yeah, it's optional. Okay, four. Yes, uh, I think we will. Uh, we need a normal yeah, yeah. reference uh, there. Okay. I think Andrew already answered. One of you guys already Great. answered number four. Yeah. So okay, and can go back. Let's. Yeah, this one. Uh, it, uh, the diagram. 
X yeah. run trip. Um, the main thing to talk about is th is this diagram oh, yeah. right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah do people think that this is yeah, a useful model for? Do other implementers right. agree that this is a model that they would like? Yeah. Right. Uh, first one, I like the concept here is they have an installer. Yeah. The installer that's yeah. actually good one that uh, application solve that need to the job. It can right. be delegated to some installer. It's a more centrally managed device. Yep. Uh, but on the cover, I think concept, the product part is still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, need yeah, facilitate yeah, yeah. talk with OTI yeah. AG, uh, client, right. talk to TE, right? Yeah. The job, right? The installer does job for the client application, yes, yes, right? It's, yes. a, it's just a more uh, beta management model or correct. another option. I agree that. Yeah, correct. So that's why yeah. I, I don't, I'm not trying to say that everybody should use model two. Uh -huh. What I'm trying to yeah. say is Different that as an yeah. implementer, yeah. The document mm -hmm. is written for one, and I wanted to use model two, uh -huh. and I wanted a document that would allow me to use model two. Okay. Uh, I don't believe I'm asking for anything that could not be perfectly backwards compatible okay. if you had an existing implementation. Uh -huh. right? and I just mean that you would be using different messages or be using optional fields. You'd skip some messages like create SD or whatever it is. So. Okay. Yeah, and then, okay, okay go back uh, almost a lot. What's it? It's just here, just here. No, no, the existing one? The existing one? This one? Yeah, yeah. This yeah. One. You say we lack of uh, uh, syntax. That's an interesting one. I think we, uh, it's an open discussion. Uh, I, I, currently I, was I am fine with no syntax defined there because I would prefer a model where I didn't need that message at all, right? Right, do we need a message, change, right? What it, the TA, yeah, uh, what's yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. This is, I'm, a t uh, I'm well, AppX, need a TA, right? I'm a fool, right? I need a TA. From this T, so yeah. now that become new message. Correct. I would Do we like need to define that not? Yeah. I think that's why. The it's difference like, yeah. between this line, yeah, and this line where there's no syntax defined is yeah. only the fact that this one is no TRP message that is signed and mm. originates in here, mm. as opposed to one that is the untrusted one. I'm saying I don't care about the syntax for an untrusted one. That was. I think there should be a new OTRP message. Uh, that was assumed that that was left to time providers. Yeah. They manage their relationship with their client. That was the original scope yeah, yeah, side. Yeah. But uh, okay, right. here. So the, well. the yeah. transport session, which is not shown here, it was on your slide on the slide we had earlier. The transport yeah. session in general has to be initiated outbound, right? Yeah. Because it could be firewalls and stuff here. It's only outbound will work. Mm. So that means if the connection is outbound here, it's not a burden to have the first message be in the OT period client to the TAM if a message were defined. Yeah. So it should be as an implementer. For reasons, including the ones that David is going to talk about earlier or later, because okay. I don't want to steal his thunder, um, which I have the same issues as he's going to talk about, right? Because yep. uh, I mentioned I was doing this on an SGX capable laptop and wanted to work for either. Um, uh, I wanted this message and couldn't find one. So yep. there you okay. go. Yeah, now I go back to the first slide. Okay. So I think we want to talk about the individual, uh, this, uh, putting the numbers together. Okay. Yeah, don't talk about two. Yeah, that's yeah. the one that's in the next presentation. Yeah. Uh, number one. Uh, number one. Uh, oh, yeah, that's what we just talked about. Oh, yeah, number yeah, one yeah. is what we just talked about. But the one we talk about is this uh, encryption. So they have different. Uh, uh, you talk about secure domain. The one, Which one? Encryption was the one that multiple. Andrew was commenting on. Multiple. Oh yeah, create SD. Uh, the, no. This one. Oh uh, yeah. I uh, do. Okay. Document I just read here. We talking about just assume it's a, we don't have a separate equipment key per SD. It's a per SP. Okay, per server provider. What do we say? So this value oh, T SP. AIK, anonymous uh, encryption key. It's a newly generated one. It's uh, on first secure domain creation. Yeah, yeah. You generate SP encryption key and send it back in time. In future, second secure domain, you don't need that. So you already know right. it has there. So that, that is a current document. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, okay. it's not required okay, so to have a separate question. one. So I think we, we right. need to move okay. on. So be, before we start with David, I, want, I just wanted to call out a couple of logistical things. So uh, no, I don't need that. You can give it to Dave. So given that you've listed out the 10 issues, right? So I think we need to start keeping track of this. So my suggestion is to start a GitHub, put the documents in there. Uh, David Wheeler has also volunteered to help be one of the editors for at least the architecture draft. We can talk about the solution draft later. So unless the group objects, and I'll announce this too in, in the email, um, we'll start tracking the issues and put the documents on GitHub. All right? Okay, so with that, let's keep moving forward. Great, so um, my name is Dave Wheeler. I'm uh, from Intel. Um, I'm gonna talk um, some about the issues um, in looking at TEEP 
in SGX. Um, I'm not going to satisfy all your curiosity about SGX. There's some references. These are posted so you can go look more about it. Um, so I just ask if we maintain our questions focused on, on TEEP. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what SGX is and then talk about some of the problems from that perspective with TEEP. I'll talk about the trusted computing base and how that has impacts to TEEP. And then I'll talk about attestation. I've got some other slides too to talk a little bit more uh, in pictures about some of the flows, which I think will um, help more of the conversation. So I'm going to go through these first ones pretty quickly, um, and then we can have questions over the pictures because I think it'll be easier to talk through that way. Uh, so SGX is very different from uh, trust zones and, and perhaps other TEEs. In, instead of having um, uh, some sort of kernel or think, something like that, all SGX is is really uh, some enclave page cache, some encrypted memory. And what an application does, an application includes the enclave code and then loads that through some processor instructions e-enter and, and um, or e-create and things to actually create the enclave. And so that, that enclave is actually part of the client process. The operating system manages the page tables but, but can't do anything to them because they're encrypted. So it's one process and um, to, for one enclave to talk to a different enclave, there has to be some, uh, some special things going on. So when an enclave is launched, the application uh, executes an instruction that talks to a, a special platform service called the launch control. And that does some integrity checks on the uh, enclave itself to make sure it's properly signed um, and with a key that's um, signed by the launch key. So all of this is kind of very different flow than um, what T kind of talks about from uh, an ARM perspective. So the first piece is the trusted application isn't separate from the client application. So typically when we deliver an application, the, all the TAs are bound into it. Um, and you don't have to go searching for a TA. TAs don't get installed separately from the client application itself. Now it isn't the case that you, you couldn't change that because uh, a trusted application it acts just like a DLL and so you could have the DLLs outside of the application and, and actually install them. But the enclave doesn't exist until the code is actually loaded. So there isn't something for me to go ask and say, hey, do you have this TA or is this TA loaded? That uh, really is a non sequitur in, in SGX. There is no security domain. At, um, because we're not, we, we don't have a, a large uh, TEE that we're separating for applications. A TEE is basically instantiated in memory for a particular enclave. So you could consider that a, a security domain of one, but you know, I think we need to talk about what, what are we trying to get out of uh, security domains. Um, and I'll talk more about that a little later. And, and so there is no really internal agent watching all the enclaves. I don't have some registry somewhere where I say, you know, I've got these 27 TAs um, installed somewhere on my platform and these three are currently running. Um, there, there isn't really that concept. An application can have one or more enclaves um, running within its process or it can have none. And um, one enclave isn't aware of what other enclaves are, are particularly doing. So uh, when we talk about install and uninstall, that, that really doesn't um, fly in, in the SGX world. There really isn't an in install or uninstall command. Um, Dave Thaler and I talked about some, some options for this. His perspective was, um, it's it's kind of onerous, I guess, in in current SGX to to go get your application signed. You've got to go get a key from Intel and um, get that signed by the launch key. We're working to make that a little easier. 
But this concept then of I've got to have a key that allows me to operate on the platform. And if I have different platforms with different keys, then, then that can become um, kind of interesting. That's where a TAM might come into place and might be very useful so that I don't necessarily have my TA signed for that platform. I use the TA to do that. So I say, hey, TA, I want to run this, or TAM, I want to run this TA. The TA will sign it for you and return it back, and then it will be able to launch on the platform. I thought that was a really interesting idea. There also isn't really a start, stop, or, or things like that. The application, the client application has control of that. Um, so let's switch a little bit to uh, SGX, uh, the trusted computing base. And, and this really goes back to, to some of the things we had talked about on the mailing list. We're not um, tied to secure boot. So the perimeter on, on the your right-hand side, you can see what SGX is. Um, attack surfaces. It's really just the hardware. SGX is implemented in, in microcode in the CPU. So its security perimeter is the CPU package. Um, all of the uh, memory, if that's off package, is, is encrypted. So, so that's outside of the, the boundary. Um, the BIOS and any of the secure boot is also outside the TCB. It's true that the BIOS does um, set up the memory um, for how, how much memory you have in the uh, Enclave page cache. But the only thing that the BIOS can do is not give you memory, so it's a denial of service. It doesn't have control of the keys or, or any of that. The OS is also formally outside of the TCB. It does control the page tables and, and things like that and can do denial of service, but it can't actually do anything with, um, with your data. So again, we, we don't really depend on secure boot. And in fact, if you're using SGX on a platform, you, you may not even have secure boot turned on. So to go ask for uh, a measurement of how your platform was booted, it may not even be possible. SGX has its own trust routes and its own keys for verification and measurement and, and so forth. So now whether secure boot is on or not, you know, that's, that's maybe more of a personal decision. And a TAM, as um, Ming pointed out, I think it's a good idea to make that optional. And then a, a TAM can then make the decision, do I really want to run um, my application on this platform if it doesn't have secure boot? And, and I guess as, as another point, what I'd like to do is talk more about maybe using EAT tokens as a way to give us more flexible attestation uh, capability in, um, in TEEP and, and then allow the claims to then be um, decided upon by the TAM and say, hey, I'd like to have this kind of token with these kinds of attestations. Um, and, and then um, that, that would give us some more flexibility, I think, going forward. But whether we want to tie those things together is, is something we can discuss. So um, the last SGX uh, set of slides here is on attestation. There's two types of attestation that happen with SGX. There's a local and, and a remote attestation. So between two enclaves on the platform, I can do an attestation between them, and that uses an AES CMAT key. So it's, it's just a, like an HMAC construct. And the uh, CPU is really the trusted entity between the two enclaves and provides measurements between them. So you can have two enclaves set up a, a trusted channel or, or share data or, or, or whatever. If you want to do an attestation outside of the platform, we call that a remote attestation. And that uses an algorithm called EPID. Um, EPID is uh, an elliptic curve group signature um, uh, algorithm. I'll talk, I have another slide to talk a little bit about that. But what you do is you, uh, an, an enclave would do a local attestation and then provide that local attestation outside of the TEE to the rich app. The rich app would then submit that to um, the quoting enclave, which has access to um, the EPID key. Uh, we don't give access to the EPID key to, to any application, right? Because it's kind of a sensitive um, capability. And so then the quoting enclave would then 
um, take that local attestation and sign it with an EPID key, and then um, that can be used to get verified um, off-platform. Hi, Dave. This is Russ. Um, just clarification, clarification question. Your AES CMAC obviously is a symmetric thing. I'm sure you did that for performance reasons. Understand that, but um, it does. Are these pairwise keys, or can there be three cooperating using the same key? That's a good. That's a good question. That's an SGX specific question, so I'll answer it very briefly, and then remind everyone I don't want to have those conversations here. So, um, <laughs> each each enclave um, gets keys. Uh, derived from some internal parameters and um, then gets a symmetric key that's unique to them and their state. When you pass that report off to another enclave, what is included in that report is information about the enclave who sent you that attestation. And then that information is then passed to the uh, CPU, which um, creates uh, that key um, or verifies that key for you. So the keys, the so, symmetric so, keys so are neither unique. neither enclave really has access to the key itself. Correct. I got it. Thank you. Yeah, otherwise you have a uh, forgery issue. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so what's relevant to TEEP? I think the, the primary thing is as we, we look at the crypto in order to be able to to do attestations to a TAM and outside entities, we need to be able to um, support EPID as an optional algorithm. I, I wouldn't say that that's something that we need to have mandatory, but for TAMs and um, TAs and service providers that want to interface with an SGX, um, they need to support um, EPID in order for, for us to do that. Uh, we could look at the local attestation as a way to simulate security domains, depending upon what security domains um, function we, we want to actually use in, in the protocol, um, other than, you know, just pure separation. Um, uh, I, I'm going to just quickly just say these are the patent rights about EPID. You can look at those if you're interested. I've done my best to find out information, but I haven't gone through all the legal stuff at Intel to say that this is um, completely accurate, but it's the best information that I have available right now. Uh, as we also look at crypto algorithms, what, one thing I'd recommend is that we look at, at post-quantum. I know Intel is very, um, is trying to make sure that all of the products and things that they're pushing out are, are post-quantum secure to the best um, of the NIST recommendations. I listed some algorithms down here based upon some reviews. I changed some of the things that we talked about at, at lunch the other day um, and adding in the, the EPID group things. Obviously, that's something that we can uh, discuss more on, on the mail list. Um, so let me transition more into some pictures where maybe we can have some more conversation. Um, uh, about this, so so out of these things, w with with some of these SGX idiosyncrasies uh, discussed, you know what what's relevant as far as TEEP services goes, right? So if we had TEEP on an SGX platform, it would operate quite a bit differently, maybe than some of the flows that are currently described. Uh, um, the TEEP agent's counterpart inside the TEE would have to be an enclave, just like any other enclave. And it wouldn't really have this omnipotent uh, universal knowledge about what's going on um, inside. So the only thing that it could really do is a best effort. If applications cooperated with some REE service that was the, the TEEP agent or broker or whatever we end up calling it, um, then, then that agent could respond uh, out of the enclave to a TAM um, to, to discuss um, you know, what's probably installed and what's probably available. But really, because of the way that SGX is normally packaged today, that may or may not be um, uh, real useful. Um, it, the most important information that would be, um, hey, how much memory has been allocated to, um, 
uh, to SGX. How big is my um, page cache? Because I don't want to have a 128 megabyte page cache and trying to download a 200 megabyte a TA. But um, so, so there might be some things that are limited, but what, what I wanted to, let's see, do we have the other? Oh, this is not the latest set of, of slides. It doesn't have any of the pictures in them. Yeah, this is the last slide. If I disconnect the projector, I can. Okay. You want me to do that? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, so let's go to then slide 14. Okay. So, sorry for that, folks. Um, the, the right slides are, are online. So um, we've, we've talked a lot about um, sort of how applications are packaged. Could you, um, can you expand that a little bit? Just zoom in or? Uh, not because it's the PDF I'm looking at, right? Yeah. Go up to the toolbar and do the plus. Ah, yes. There we go. That, that's much better. Yeah, that's, that's good enough. Okay, so, so we've talked a lot about how TAs are packaged and, um, and some of this has to do with how they're signed. So um, I spent some time you know, thinking about this from an SGX perspective, kind of folding in some of Dave's um, uh, ideas and things. And so as, as I look at this, or as I think about this, I, I see kind of four quadrants. Um, along the top, I've got uh, my TA packaged with my client app. And on the um, left-hand side, the TA is fully signed. So it's it's got the right signatures for the TA to actually be able to be deployed and, and run on the platform. On the right-hand side, the TA may be signed. It's signed by an SP or a developer, but it doesn't have the right signature for the platform. Um, and so this is where it might be interesting to be able to, uh, for the Rich app or for OTRP, to be able to send that that bucket of bits that the t that is the TA and say, hey, can you sign this for me so that I can run it on, on this particular platform? Along the bottom, you have sort of the more um, the more common ways that we've been talking about TAs where they're they're separate, and you could have the same kind of of situation um, as well. Oh, okay, next slide. <laughs> All right, so. So in, in the case where the TA is packaged with SGX, you would install the application by some means, whether it's a USB stick or, or something like that. You get that onto the application, and then the client application has to run, and it would have to talk to some TEEP agent or broker or something and say, hey, is my TA properly signed? If it is, then um, the application would just load it and, and run it. And there's no need for, for TAM interaction. Um, the TEEP agent could do sort of a courtesy registration and say, okay, now I know I've got this, this TA um, 
that's that's running. There's no really security domain. Maybe it's a security domain of one if if we um, choose to to look at it that way. When the client app goes away, the TA goes away. If it crashes, the T page it may not even know that that it's gone. Um, there isn't really an uninstall or an update or a delete TA because it's very um, ethereal. It go goes along with the, the client app. So go ahead to the next slide. But what if the TAs weren't bound to the client app um, or, or we chose to treat them that way, right? Then we could use TEEP as sort of a TA registry, which is more in line with the way that um, I think uh, uh, Ming, you've been been looking at it, right? And so the client apps could ask for a particular type of TA in the platform's registry. Um, this would have to sort of be done through an untrusted interface. And and one of the things that's leaving me a little uneasy is when I get that TA back to the client app, how do I know that that untrusted part of um, the TEEP agent didn't lie to me? You know, maybe the Enclave gave the right bucket of bits back to um, the TEEP agent, but the TEEP agent lied because it doesn't like me um, and and sends me the wrong bucket of bits. Um, so the client app, and, and this is an issue because the client app is the one that has to instantiate it, right? In, in the trust zone side, when you ask for a TA, it gets instantiated by a trusted agent inside trust zone. But in, in SGX, it doesn't work that way. The bucket of bits kind of has to come out and then um, get put back in. So let's go to the next slide. So, so the way I kind of thought about this um, is, so you install the app, um, and then in step two, you say, hey, I, I need these two, uh, these TAs, right? And so I showed that I've got some dependency, it's probably a manifest that's signed or something like that. And, and that would go into the TEEP agent's enclave. Um, and then that TEEP agent enclave would, would um, go and talk to the TAM. Now, obviously that does have to, I didn't show it here because it gets a little crazy. It would have to go back out to the TEEP agent and the TEEP agent would have a socket, right, uh, out to the TAM. And then that TAM act interaction would either get a signed TA um, if it wasn't in the registry. The, the TEEP agent, the Enclave, could maintain a registry uh, of TAs, um, just like we do in, um, in Trust Zone. Um, whether we want to do that or not becomes interesting as we talk more about, you know, normally the SGX enclaves are tied to a particular application. And um, that's because um, keys and secrets and things like that are sealed to the enclave. So if we share, um, if uh, Hannes and I share a TA, then or an, uh, an enclave in the SGX case, then I can see Hannes's keys and misuse them because I'm an evil guy. And then I could, you know, sign him up for a big debt or something like that and get the check. So there, there's reasons why we probably don't want to sign, do T, uh, share TAs that way. And that's something we can can talk about as, as we move forward. But if we did that, this this would sort of be a way um, to allow that to to occur. In in, the, in this case, then you know, uninstall and update and delete of TAs actually makes sense because you'd be talking to to this registry. I still think we have some sort of issue with return when the TEEP agent enclave returns the uh, in in the last step returns the TA to the untrusted app or the client app, it has to go through the TEEP agent and, and that's where the TA could be, um, could be attacked and that becomes uh, uh, problematic. Um, not, not so much that the um, TA itself could be changed because the uh, integrity will be checked on the load um, by SGX. But if I don't know what specific TA I'm trying to get, it might have other functionality in it that would allow someone else to do something that I don't want it to do. Um, so we have to sort of talk about that. And that may require the client app to do some additional verification, like I said in yellow there, right? Do some sort of secondary verification. Is this really the TA that I wanted? Check the hash, check um, the developer signature on it, check the version number and things like that. So 
Um, you know, and as we as we kind of use some of these uh, sequences to talk about um, like the the TIDs and the RIDs, if I've got multiple TAs talking to the TAM, I don't have a I, I may not have a universal agent right talking to the TAM. So um, how we do that, how we get that um, uh, the RIDs and things like that to work um, become interesting. Um, and then, um, oh, the next slide I think is the summary. So, as I as I thought through this, I tried to reduce down what I think we need to do. Um, I think we still need lots of conversations about how the app is is packaged, and what TEEP messages apply to that, and how what security implications we tie to those. But other than that, you know, that that's sort of that TA delivery within a client. I, we have to talk about how that works and, and make sure we preserve the security. Um, EPID needs to be supported as a, an optional algorithm. Um, we should look at post-quantum key sizes and, and increase those because I think they're, they're kind of the smaller sizes and at least make those um, optional to, to support. Um, I think we already talked about the secure boot stuff. Um, I think one of the things we haven't talked a lot about, uh, Ming, and I think we we need to have that conversation is, what is the security um, domain really doing for me? What what do I get from that? I understand sort of the container aspect, but do I get access to shared keys? Do I get access to shared data? What does it mean to package two TAs in one security domain? Other than just ease of management, right? Ease of management could be one thing, but what does that mean inside the TEE? And make sure we crisp up that definition and um, if we're gonna continue to use that. Um, and I, I think it's fine to then say in some instances, like in ARM, there, there can be a security domain of more than one on SGX. It would, would likely be just one. And then we'd have to look at if it's valuable, how do we simulate that? Because I think we could do that if we needed to. Um, and I think we've already started to address some of the platform specific things that, uh, that are there. So, um, so that was, that was really fast through SGX. If you see me around and you have some questions, please feel free to, you know, ask me, I'd be very happy to talk to you about it some more. Um, but maybe there's some questions over what, what we've talked about. We, we can go back to some of the other slides if we need to. Now's the time to speak up. So procedurally, Dave has put the list of uh, the recommendations. And I think, I don't remember if it was Hannes or Ming. So we've already talked about having support of the TA delivery within a client application. So I guess rather than reading each one of them again, since Dave has already gone through them, the question that I put here is, are there any objections to the musts and shoulds that are on this list. I agree with them, fine, or if they say, yeah, I can live with that, okay, is there anything that you could not live with, with. and that that's on the slide? Mm -hmm. Uh, this is Hannes. I will have um, two comments. The, the first one is about the uh, EBIT. And in some sense, you, you raised the question of like, um, how do we accommodate for different attestation mechanisms? Because it's not just the algorithm, it's, it's more than that. Right. And, and you proposed, uh, so, or you sort of brainstormed about the idea on the eat token uh, usage. And, and maybe that's a, uh, a way forward, depends on how that's moving along. But it's, it is indeed an issue that uh, will have implications on both the protocol document, but also the, the, the architecture document in, in supporting those. And we talked about the key usage. So that's, a, I would say, a bigger change. Um, the, the other aspect, um, you referred to post-quantum. And I always, um, at least for me, I associate it with uh, post-quantum algorithms, more like the stuff that Russ is doing with... Uh, hash-based signatures, not so much with uh, longer key lenses, like as you had pointed out, I think those are recommendations for today's usage. Uh, and maybe we need to really, like, I think it would be great if we could just have uh, a CS CFRG recommendations in general, because that pops up in different groups. I just had this discussion recently in the in uh, 
in the ACE group on what key lens and what algorithms should be used. And is that is uh, we use NIST uh, P256 uh, R1 now and to be recommend for something else for the future and so on and so on. It seems a, a topic that is a cross working group. So I would prefer to just defer this to some other group and just make that recommendations and I, be done with it. Yeah, I think that's fine, Hannah. So if I were to interpret what you're saying for the third bullet, I don't think you're objecting. I think it's just the question of how we move, move forward. So again, the question on the floor is because of time, Please only speak up if you have objections, because we're getting short on time. Things on this slide, Hank. Yeah, I agree with, uh, disagree with uh, TEEP should not require secure boot attestation. I would agree that TEEP should not require the deprecated secure boot and the now uh, current attest uh, authenticated boot, because that is what it is now. Um, I would uh, strip the term attestation from secure boot entirely. I would... Uh, TEEP must avoid definition and of operations is okay. And uh, definition operations secure boot again is deprecated, it's authenticated boot. Okay, so you're really objecting to the fourth one. I'm, I want secure boot as legacy and authentic, authenticated boot as current. And I would not a tie attestation to secure boot because this makes no sense That's at a all. fair point. And, and again, I'm just trying to get the clarification in the interest of time. What I'd yeah. like to be able to do procedurally is for the ones that we need objection or clarification, we'll put them back on the list, keep Thanks. them as an issue track. Okay. Right. No, the other one is just to get confirmation. Okay. Otherwise, I don't want this to, to go on. Right. Thanks. I'm trying to figure out how many GitHub issues we want to file as we go. Yes. So, far, one. Okay, we'll file it. Yeah. so uh, this is a first one, a question, second bullet. EPIT, I remember I actually use it, but I saw that Intel has a pattern on it. So we didn't choose it in the beginning. So we went down the path to just use CA. I know you have group public key you to play the same role. Yeah. Let, let, now, let me comment on that. Pattern. I, I think that uh, there's many ways to allow algorithm agility. Um, including ways that include things like IANA registries and so on. And so there are ways to allow vendor to do vendor specific things that have been done in other protocols. And Dave is just saying, should there be some way to allow a vendor specific algorithm here because there's a use case for that for, for using EPID and it would be nice if there was some way for that vendor to use this protocol. Okay, okay, yeah, that's, yeah, must support that all. But I think in a third bullet, a third bullet I would say, should support quantum, I would like to say, uh, it's all it does, but I say that was to me is that should support algorithm agility and algorithm agility because post more quantum as a hands away on the same page, right? It's a really algorithm solve, right? ECC and IC broken by quantum or potentially, right? So okay. size we all have agility there. I think algorithm agility as a requirement, say the, this protocol must support algorithm agility. I think we already do that today, but uh, okay, so default. I'm not hearing the objection, okay. so. What we'll, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So what we'll do is we'll we'll put the fourth one as an issue. Yep. We'll put the other ones as confirmation on the list. And it sounds like you know what I would ask for those that have spoken up is to make clarifications, Hannes and Ming, right, to the third one for the post quantum, to put the recommendation for how we could move forward to them. Hearing none, no objections. Second Sorry, second and third. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other, is, is that? Okay, thanks Dave. Okay, any other? Well, I, 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 can, I can ramble, but no, we, we're down to one and a half. So last order of business, did everybody sign the blue sheets? Okay, so just come on up and uh, so uh, look for the GitHub and then once, I guess one of us will set it up. Uh, We'll start working through the issues there for each draft. Thanks, everyone. So, do you know how to set up a GitHub? Or do you want me to set up GitHub? Um, I have set up GitHub, so I've never set up an IETF. Okay. But if I want to, feel free.
I should figure it out, but I've, I've almost said that's the other part of the story. So. Oh, okay.